All right, perfect. We might get underway. This is this is recorded, so if anybody misses the start, um, yeah, I'm sure you can catch up on that. Um, but before we get underway, I want to acknowledge uh, this country's First Nations people and their ongoing strength in practicing the world's oldest living culture. Um, so we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters in which we live and work. For me, um, here in Sydney, that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So we pay our respects to their elders, um, past, present, and emerging. Um, a really quick introduction, I think, um, really pleased. We, we get a lot of feedback uh, on our webinars that uh, we, we want more kind of practical uh, experience. People that have been there, that have done the job, and that have been in the trenches. And I think there's no better person that uh, fits that brief than, than Ryan. Um, Ryan, let me really quickly introduce yourself before I go on. Okay, yes. Um, so a little bit about me. My name's Ryan McGrory. Um, I'm a recovering journalist and marketer, actually. Uh, so that's what I used to do in a former life uh, before I started working in corporate business for a while and spent around 10 years at UB Insurance, uh, looking after employee experience and people analytics, engagement, comms, recognition uh, as head of EX and comms there. Uh, but over the top, last 10 years, workplace well-being has been my thing. Um, I've built multi-award-winning programs, designed analytical models uh, to measure well-being. I've contributed to university studies uh, to research the effectiveness of well-being initiatives and also worked with HR tech companies and partnered with neuroscience institutes, uh, all in the name of improving workplace well-being. So that's a little bit about me and what I do. But right now, I lead a company called Exona, uh, which is to wrap up all of that experience and then share uh, my expertise and knowledge to help other uh, companies improve their employee experience, well-being, comms, and whatever else, culture, really. But that's me in a nutshell. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we uh, established our unmined office in Australia in 2020. I met Ryan shortly after that, kind of at the tail end of his work with Yui, and he's always has, has always really impressed me. I like people that are particularly direct and people that are intentional about the things that they do, and I think that's something that you'll come to appreciate, appreciate about Ryan over the next 50 minutes or so. Um, really, really thoughtful, as grounded in the evidence-based. And um, the thing that I particularly like is, uh, maybe this comes from your people analytics heritage, but the concept of measuring everything. So we can't manage what we can't measure, which is very much uh, aligned with Unmind's philosophy. Um, just, in terms of, yeah. Sorry? Oh, Nothing. Oh, good. I just seen a little notification saying closed captioning has now now started. So I was just saying a little good luck to it um, to catch <laughs> catch the accent. Well, between the two of us, yeah. Um, <laughs> we're going to start with some quick fire questions that I think will help you appreciate uh, Ryan's context a little bit more. We're going to talk about the award winning program at UWE and some of the elements that I think Ryan's particularly proud of. Uh, we're going to move into some of the failed experiments. I think we always, we, we attend these webinars and we hear a lot about, you know, the things that uh, we achieved that we're really proud of, but you don't get there without making a few mistakes. So I think it, it's worthwhile sharing some of those so that you don't have to make the same ones. Uh, we talk about Ryan's transition into consulting, uh, the evolution that uh, that we've observed in, in well-being and, and Ryan's perspective on that before uh, closing out with um, everybody's favorite predictions uh, for the future. We're gonna launch our first poll. We're gonna make today as interactive as possible. There will be three polls throughout. Um, I think, yeah, we just wanted to get a sense really early on. Um, a lot of you, it will be your solar mandate. Some of you, uh, it will be, uh, you'll be moonlighting in, in terms of well-being effort, but we wanna understand um, how you feel about your efforts today. Um, we have a fair few in the good, uh, we have a fifth of you dissatisfied. Uh, let me just share the results. It's quite interesting about almost 70% of you uh, feel as if you're on the right track, but you could be doing better. Uh, congratulations to the 12% of you that are, are very satisfied. Um, and let's uh, try and educate over the next over the next fifty minutes the twenty one percent uh, who who have a big opportunity to do to do better. Um, all right. Well, this this will be about a five minute section. 
uh, I want, I think Ryan's got a really interesting story and this context that he brings um, makes the work that he does today even, even more valuable. I think, um, Ryan, let's start with the really simple one. Um, where, whereabouts are you from? You, you speak a little different to the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, Jackie in the comments has has nailed it in the chat. Uh, so from the west coast of Scotland, uh, just outside of Glasgow, a little village called Dentoker. Uh, is where I grew up. My family's from from Donegal in Ireland, actually, um, and where I'm at right now is in Cubby Cubby Country, uh, Sunshine Coast, and in, in, in beautiful Queensland. Um, I know you're a, you're a family man. Let's talk about what a what's your favourite family activity. Uh, favorite one's really simple actually. Um, it's a passeggiata, uh, so a nighttime walk or, a, or just a nice family walk we like to have. So my wife's uh, part Italian, and that's a really good habit and a really good activity that we have is just to go out uh, of an evening and enjoy a bit of a walk. Yeah, perfect. Um, and let's talk about non-negotiables. So personally, do you have any uh, well-being non-negotiables that um, you enforce every day? So the Parigiana might be one. What else do you have? That's good. That's a good question. So the, uh, I'd say the two, right? Um, one would be family time. Um, so I think that's super important for, for anyone's uh, well-being um, and exercise. Uh, so both of these things are important for my, my sanity uh, as well as, well as my well-being. So that's my two, my two must-haves, family time uh, and a bit of exercise, a bit of movement. Thank you. Um, four, four more questions before we move on. I really, I really like these ones. Um, what's your personal accomplishment that you're most proud of? Um, I, you know, I, I really struggle with these questions usually, um, but I'll uh, I'll try and use a, a recent example. Um, geez, uh, yesterday, you know, again, simple, uh, just making it to the gym after a daycare drop-off during peak hour school traffic um, and walking through the doors of the gym despite smelling of baby sick and soup. Um, so soup's a weird one. Um, I, I did an online shopping on the weekend and accidentally bought a bag of carrots that were big enough to feed a family of Clydesdales. Um, it was absolutely huge. You know, looking at the picture on my phone, I thought it was a normal sized bag of carrots. So I was up yesterday morning making soup and despite all my efforts, I still made it to the gym. So that was a pretty good and recent personal accomplishment. Wow, perfect. What about professionally? <laughs> Hopefully no carrots involved in this one. <laughs> uh, yeah dangling a few carrots maybe um, uh, but I think you know professional the thing that comes to mind for me is uh, winning seven HR awards in, in five years um, uh, and that was from our work in designing health and well-being strategy and programs uh, and also some pretty cool tech uh, HR tech so around gamification and recognition um, uh, and culture so, so those ones are my, my real proud moments good morning um, we talked a lot about the systemic change, and then we think, you know, our mind's belief is that a big part of that is uh, training and equipping managers with the right tools and resources um, to really help own that culture and build, you know, environments where teams can flourish. Can you tell us any, anything, your favourite manager you've ever had and why this person was your favourite manager? Um, so, yeah, so another good, another good question. I think... Um, Obvious choice for me was my um, uh, CPO at UE, um, Ivan Pierce. Um, so he was a phenomenal leader. Um, what I loved about Ivan is that he gave me his time, um, uh, which is a great quality to gift and give someone who, who wants to learn. Um, he challenged me and also supported me. Um, uh, and other than that, he was a good person to be around. So he was a good leader, a good mentor uh, and, uh, and a good friend. But um, you've always survived. And the last of the quick fire. So why are you personally so passionate about mental health and well-being? I mean, you dedicate so much time to it. Is, is there a, a, a reason for that? Yes, yes, there is. And I give this a lot of thought. You know, it's it's my it's my why, you know, why why I do what I do. It's um it's kind of helped me um really navigate a lot of decisions. Um, but put simply, um our solution i think as a com as a country as a society does not match the problem um and i want to contribute to to the movement that corrects this imbalance i want to help us get upstream be more proactive in well-being and mental health uh, help to build understanding the right capabilities in this area that helps us 
as a society constantly improve and um, improve what we do for ourselves and I think in, in the workplace context what we do for the people sitting next to us I think that we can in our generation but this is our generation the people on this call I think we we can connect to people about mental health and well-being in the same way that previous generations have around other health problems and issues and I always liken it to or my ambition um, uh, and why I'm so passionate is I think that we need to do this and I think that we can do this is to you know have the the mental health or mental well-being equivalent of of slip slop slap where it should be we just know what the the solution is and we can all it's on the tip of our tongue and we and we can all do it and that's that that's what drives me I want I want to be part of that uh, and I've seen it happen in, uh, in workplace context firsthand I've watched us change I've watched populations of people change um, uh, uh, and I want to keep doing that and I want to keep working with work, other workplaces to to help doing that because I think that it can bring a, a, a heap of change um, uh, uh, to our country as a whole. Yeah, I love that. And it's, it's really heartfelt. So let, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about that. So let's talk about, you know, some of the, the I guess the, the success, we're going to call this the top of the mountain. Um, the uh, I'm going to really quickly go through some of the highlights here. I think Ryan, you're probably too modest to do this yourself. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the detail so, um, yeah, I mean, you were out of the gates pretty early launching the program back in, in 2014, I would imagine, and particularly as we go into some of the detail and the sophistication um, that was involved. You mentioned uh, the awards, so Best Health and Wellbeing Program in Australia, um, 15, 17, and 19. Uh, and then we'll go into some of the metrics, uh, and, and again, we'll go into more detail here. So I think uh, you what, what we'll cover is, is the way that you've activated all of these activities. And I think what I love about the story is the nature of these activities. But then looking at you reduced sick leave and absenteeism. And I think if, if, if everybody else on the call uh, was able to attain these, these same results, then um, you could be equally as proud. Similarly, I know you work on the EX side as well. So looking at the cascading effect across to um, employee satisfaction and engagement. And then even better, um, the, the reduction in turnover or, or um, exits from the business that you were able to achieve. Um, so yeah, let, let's talk about the path um, to some of these things. I think, um, I don't know if we've covered a lot of this, so really forgive me if I have, but um, yeah, what kind of motivated you to launch this program in such a comprehensive way in UE? I think I think really the first part of that is I was part of an organization that was ambitious, you know, um, uh, I think I think that goes a long way when the character of an organization is to do well in their field, regardless of, of what what the issue is in your area, your department, then that's a real driver. So that's a real source of inspiration. Uh, I think separately, um, you also cared about their people, you know, actually wanted to do well by uh, and wanted to do better as a whole for their customers, for their employees. Um, so, I mean, the inspiration was having what I perceived out of that to have the permission. Yeah, I had the well-being remit, um, but was having the permission to do really well in this space. And I'm an ambitious person, so when I'm in an ambitious environment, I want to aim a, um, a, a high. Uh, in terms of looking at the need, uh, so we get inspiration there, looking at the need, Separately, well, well, first off, all organizations need a well-being solution. And if you don't think you do, I think you're kidding yourself. Um, so looking at UE, which was largely a call center environment, it was looking at the environment and understanding it and trying to understand it better and the problems and what could be gained from them. So environment and call centers are largely sedentary, but the tension point is that people need to have energy. So sedentary environments don't typically create energy. So that was one, one source of kind of inspiration of what we identified as a need. The other one was listening to our people. So listening to the feedback that people were saying, you know, people putting on weight after they started um, uh, their career, the nine to five life cycle, um, life style and all the challenges around that, you know, and the lot of places you need to get to have to be outside of those hours. 
uh, research that we looked at. So when I'm aiming high, I want to see what else is done really well out there in the field. So I want to look outside. So look inside and do a scan there. I want to look outside and see what the best in the world are doing. So it's looking at employee health and call centers and understanding the challenges uh, and how people were solving those particular challenges. Um, I think also identifying at UWE that leaders cared about this whether or not they were able to articulate it, but through their actions, you know, there was a lot of meetings around people. Uh, our CEO actually held a meeting every single Friday on people-related things. So you wanted to be involved. I wanted to understand. I wanted to know uh, what activities we were doing, what events we were doing, what solutions that we were looking at. Um, uh, and, and then, I mean, me personally, I'm a marketer of previous life. I was a journalist. I was working in PR, all about comms and branding. I'm always thinking about ways to connect to people better and having that continuous improvement mindset. So that's always where I'm at, um, regardless of looking at the start or even right now. It's always, you know, where are we at? How could how could we connect to people um, more? How could we do it differently? How can we do it better? Cool. I think that's a really nice um, segue into that. I, we, we, I think we, we'll cover some of the executive buy-in, the leadership support later, because that's a very common challenge that I expect everybody faces. But you talked about continuous improvement um, that goes hand in hand with measurement. Um, any advice or, uh, you know, I guess, where you've been really successful in initially establishing that measurement and then um, you know, measuring the efficacy over time? Um, yes, yes. And that's that's a good question because I think I think it's, it's super important. I mean, you can't really evaluate something unless you measure it in, in the instance. So having that mindset around measuring success um, uh, uh, is super helpful. In fact, it's the, it's the foundation of why I've won awards or why I've been able to show the impact in any of those metrics that you're looking at right now. It all comes back to measuring measuring something. Um, so I think if there's any advice to give, and maybe just drawing on you know past experience and what I'm doing now, now with clients is setting up a philosophy for measurement, which could be super simple, um, is you know measuring participation. Um, just who's showing up to things or who's been included in things or who's been involved in things to do with well-being. Um, back in 2014, I was doing that with a clipboard. I was going to, to, to events, to, to sessions that were running and writing down people's names. It could be as simple as that. But also the opportunity to measure is looking outside sometimes um, uh, uh, and looking at other ways to measure, you know, other, other data sources such as people's feedback. So running surveys and focus groups and getting an understanding on where things are at or how you can improve. Um, looking at industry feedback. So what the industry says about what you're doing or what you can gather um, as best practice and then conducting your, your own analysis as well. Um, so that's what we typically relied on in our program. We did emphasize our own analysis an awful lot and that was done because we could measure our participation. And once you start measuring who show, what you're doing and who's showing up, then you could start to look at um, uh, uh, different splits in the data. So looking at who's participating in things and who isn't and what the experience is of those two groups. That's a simple way to do it. So we've got people in column A who are participating in health and well-being activities or they're showing up to events or they're uh, consuming information or they're downloading, you know, um, uh, technology. And you've got a group of people who, who perhaps aren't. And you look at the experience of those two groups, whether it comes to sick leave and absenteeism, employee satisfaction, productivity, or whatever other measure you want to look at. And then you've got some comparative data. And that is a great source for, for learning um, uh, uh, the impact of what you're doing. But then going back to participation, is are people participating? Are enough of people participating? What can you do to, to, uh, to improve? So I could I could talk really about data for for ages. Um, the model that I've relied on is one really simple. Again, it's one I've put put together not on a right, remember writing it on a whiteboard one time. It's just three A's. So it's a sort of three punch combination. I like to call it. The first is attitude, and that's been set up to listen in the right way. So that's looking at what you measurements you could be collecting. So that's the first A. The second A is analysis. So having the right people or the right processes in place for making sense of things. So extracting insights and figuring out what your solution should be. And then the third A is your approach. So that's kind of pulling your finger out and taking action. So I think with that 
kind of philosophy or that mindset of having the right attitude towards measuring the right things, the analysis. So looking at the what you're measuring and taking insight from it and then the approach is taking action. And over time, having this as a mindset and implementing things and thinking carefully about this as a philosophy, you get to do it much quicker and um, you get to figure out where you where you sh where you should be putting your effort, where you'd be better placed to put your effort. Um, uh, but that's that's the, probably the best advice I would give. And 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 this is a start. I would say just make a start. You know, start measuring something and and begin to learn. Because once you do, um, uh, it could be it could be in the nicest way addictive. I was literally about to say that. I mean, measure. Yeah, I can attest to that. Measurement becomes quite addictive. And um, yeah, once you get sophisticated at it. It kind of leads, I guess, into my next question. Um, so, I mean, how did you involve your senior leadership? Uh, and I guess, how did their involvement evolve over time um, in supporting your success? Um, I think that would be really useful for the audience to, to better understand. Hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, leadership are a huge stakeholder um, uh, in the business. And you could say really without having them on board somewhat, then it becomes a huge challenge to make real traction with with well-being. You know, I, I, I maybe even go as far to say that you need them to role model this in order to have a real world class approach. I'm not saying that it's essential or absolutely necessary, but you you know it's it's definitely up there. They're a key stakeholder. Um, so the advice I'd give, and I, I think there may be a, actually a little link to 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 the guide I've written. It's definitely in there as well. The advice I'd give is is early engagement of all your all of your stakeholders, you know, to involve and engage the right people, engage them in the development, and engage them in the implementation of the program. When people have been involved with their ideas, not only do they have that sense of buy-in and empowerment, but they improve the quality of your output. So they they improve your approach to well-being. So getting them involved in the developmental stage with their feedback, their ideas, them actively involved in the planning helps later on. Also, the approach that you might have to involving leaderships, I wouldn't think it's perhaps staged, but continuous. Um, in the programs I've helped run, whether it was with well-being or comms or recognition or, or employee experience, it was getting the group of people I needed to influence and thinking about how I could influence them. So similar to that marketing type mindset is they're an audience group that I, I need to influence. They're an audience group who are important. They're an audience group who are actually participants as well. I need to get them involved. So I'd make sure that I was in the right meetings. I was sending them the information that they were interested in. So sending them data, sending them sources, sending, making things easy for them. So writing um, uh, speaking notes for them to represent in the departments, setting up competitions for them. So doing department versus department or business unit versus business unit and giving them a, um, a, a, a reason to be interested, producing reports, showing and demonstrating the impact. So the what's in it for me uh, and also make sure that solutions as part of the program were designed for that group as well i'm pre really proud that and uh, it was able to design what i felt was a world-class executive health program as well understanding this audience group was key and significant for how well-being was represented throughout the company i wanted to make sure that they they were not only ambassadors of it but they were participants so i think that's another another way but that's that that's how i would involve involve senior um, uh, 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 leadership or leaders as a whole is getting them part of the creation of it get them um, uh, uh, involved in the implementation of it get them involved in giving feedback and make sure that they're part of the actual program as well cool. I, love that. I love I love that idea of the sense of competition uh, I think we can probably all relate to that um, particularly competitive people in our business will be um, the senior executives and uh, to be able to positively role model, feel that sense of involvement, um, you're going to get a better outcome. And I know you hesitated to say that it was a critical element, but I think, yeah, we, from what I've observed in, in, in the, the three years that I've been doing this, I think if we don't have uh, executive sponsorship um, in the programs mm. that we support, then they're destined for failure. And I think that would be yep. something I would earmark yep. early on. I'm going to move yeah, to some of the people. You go, Ryan. I would... I was going to say, I have seen examples where bottom-up has worked. You know, you might only need one 
or two of those senior leaders out of a whole group to be on your side and then you could start working on it so i have seen examples there where you don't need the whole executive team to be whole body involved in it for it to work bottom up can be really effective um uh, uh, as well but yeah just want to add to that well, we, let's let's. Uh, I'll have the whole screen here because I think we we need to talk about some of these second order effects and some of the um, really 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 interesting research you've done. I think the last question before we go to this was, um, you know, those participation rates are really high. I think um, that people will be, will be envious of that level of participation. What was the secret sauce? How did you communicate to employees and encourage their participation? Um. Yeah. I mean, having a that mindset from the beginning that we were going to be in this for the long haul was was definitely helpful because I've now consulted with a lot of other organizations and I think I think sometimes um, uh, people have the idea that they're launching a campaign, not an actual strategy. And there's a difference there. A campaign is kind of short lived and has a beginning and an end. Um, but a commitment and a strategy to well-being is ongoing. And I think that makes a difference where your employees and your people see that it's not a fly by the night initiative. It's something that's kind of here to be developed and here there to be improved and is an actual commitment. And that's a big, big difference, a big difference in mindset, but also a difference in, in, uh, uh, in how you approach this. In terms of like the advice I would give around this and, and what I've done in the past, um, the strategies I'd use is to, is to, uh, is to brand the thing, you know, give it a voice. It doesn't mean it has to have logos and sophistication, but give it an actual voice and a story and a communication plan and strategy to support it. So think about your rhythms as an organization and um, think about your channels and think, think about your life cycle. So where are the opportunities to talk about well-being on channels or all throughout the life cycle, whether it's at the attraction phase when you're, you know, interviewing new employees and you're telling them about your approach towards well-being and what they can get involved in, or is it with the onboarding phase and, and letting people know when they start, here's all the opportunities. For every single phase, I think there's an opportunity there to, to communicate to people effectively what the program is or what the strategy is or what your approach is and how they can personally benefit from it. I think having a calendar could be helpful, not not essential, but it could be helpful. People see that your uh, your efforts go beyond the next thing. You know, there's going to be a life to this to this um, uh, approach. I'm a huge believer in recognition, so I studied gamification for three years and launched programs and designed tools around gamification. So I'm a huge big believer in that recognition makes a big difference. Um, what I've done even in its some simple stages is give people points for attending. So, you know, simple at first, come to along to a thing and get a point, and compete with your um, uh, uh, yourself or compete with others. Little initiatives like um, we did the 100 Club. Um, so whoever attended the 100 activities in the calendar year got a T-shirt and people go crazy for T-shirts, by the way. I've given out all prizes. I've given out holidays and um, uh, given out Playstations and, you know, you know huge, huge prizes. Um, and people go crazy for a T-shirt, which is which is amazing. Um, but thinking about other ways that you can convince people to be involved is also helpful. So is it a free breakfast uh, for those who show up to the to the boxing class in the morning? Is that going to be helpful? Is it a free coffee voucher for those who show up to the to the online session um, uh, 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 on mental health literacy? Do you need large events and small events to mix things up, you know, to appeal to different different needs? Do you need to communicate things big? Do you need to communicate things uh, in and amongst departments and have departmental challenges? Do you need quests? You know, do you need to give something like um, uh, exciting for people to complete? Do they have to do two walks and attend, you know, five learning sessions and, you know, refer two people on to get in the draw for some sort of prize? So I love that type of thing, but also making it easy for others to communicate on your behalf. And I think we all struggle with this and people in culture and hate and hate Charland um, is that we take on the burden of responsibility for everything that comes out of our department. And it could be sometimes difficult for us to go outside of that and get other people speaking on our behalf. Um, a cheap way to do it, I'd say, is create really simple speaking notes for leaders. And um, that's something we've relied on in the, in the past. Desk dropping um, uh, uh, calendars as well. So putting our little calendars on people's desks. We even created little book that we gave to people when they started on their first day. I've got a copy right here. This was our program uh, when I worked at UE and we kind of tell people, you know, welcome to, to the program and, you know, what they can get involved in and can see some imagery of 
uh, uh, how they can be involved, that stuff's effective um, uh, as well. So I think what I'm saying is it's a multifaceted and a multi-tactical program that thinks up and down the life cycle, that has a voice, that has a comms plan, and it's supported not just by a campaign, but by an actual actual strategy and inside the rhythms of your own org. Yeah. I love that. And hopefully people are taking notes furiously. We've spoken about, yeah, some of the key program parameters and the really positive outcomes for UE. I'd like to give you a moment to speak about some of these phenomenal outcomes for individuals. We know that work is supposed to be good for us. And I think your results would indicate that that, that indeed was the case. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, a commitment to measuring things. I mean, what I wanted to do, I mean, there was the side of me, I wanted to show our people that there was real value in this and, and, and to show the value, you have to show the value. Right. So that was, that was, that was an amazing thing that we, that we felt was necessary. I also knew when we launched this program in year one, I got $5,000 to launch our wellbeing program for the year. So I knew I needed to, to, to speak the language of our organization, which was data. I needed to show that there was there was to be impact made. There was to be a return on investment with our with our efforts and well being. So I wanted to measure and show that this is having an impact on our organisation and this is having an impact on our people's life. Um, so I wanted to measure ourselves, but I also wanted some some outside measurement to be included in that as well. Um, so we ran some some independent surveys every two years that looked at the lifestyle risk of our people. Um, so it's a basic uh, survey questionnaire. Um, uh, uh, that looked at lifestyle factors and the risks associated with them, um, as well as musculoskeletal factors. And we ran that every two years and we showed that uh, of our overall population, we'd had health improvements um, over the course of four years. So from the first to the, to the third um, uh, survey, we showed that people's lives had had um, uh, uh, reduced in risk, or rather not reduced in risk, they improved, but they reduced their, their, their high risk uh, factors as well as that i wanted to show that the components of our of our program uh, could be evaluated so we got a deacon university researcher to come in and look at the the parts of our program um, uh, and then look at their effectiveness for, for for improving cognitive and mental health as well as physical health as well so that was important as well as another data source to say that you know what we're doing the right thing and we can actually measure its impact. We can show our stakeholders that it's working. So we can show our people that their investment in this, so their participation is worthwhile. We can show um, uh, uh, our organization that the investment in this should be continuous. We should keep investing in this. In fact, we should invest more in this because it's so worth worthwhile. Um, yeah, but that's that was some of the results we've seen. And, and for me personally, in developing the philosophy of this program, um, I wanted to, I had this feeling we're, we're starting it. And I think it's the same for anyone starting it is you can have a well, well-being program that ticks boxes. You can have a well-being program that's good for people, or you can have a well-being program and strategy that actually improves people's lives and helps them stay on this planet for a little bit longer. And that was, that's what we wanted to do. And I wanted to show it um, eh, eh, as well. So that's where we got these results from. That's why we had those results, and um, uh, and yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty happy, pretty proud of those those. But I think they're also possible for for any organisation, and that's what I'm doing now with my clients is to try and help them achieve achieve real results. Um, so this hopefully shows shows um, uh, a little bit how. Yeah, it, it, it definitely does. Um, all right, let's let's move on. Um, <coughs> Actually, I might ask you a question. There's, a, there's an interesting one that's come through from Lauren, and it feels like it's actually, um, it sounds like you're doing a lot. Uh, she's put it in the chat. Uh, anyone else, please put questions in the Q&A. We're going to have time mm. at the end. But I think this one, Lauren's asked the size of your well-being team um, to deliver a program like this, or were you reliant on uh, on volunteers? Um, so, yeah, I can, I can give you the specifics around this. So everything that happened in the first two years was just myself. Um, so, so the results on that slide before, I was still running the program just myself to about just less than a thousand people. Um, and then after that, I had um, um, we enlisted one other person in the team, and that was the case for about one other year. And then by the time I built the team up over, over about eight, years now so we looked after a lot of things in this department there was about six or seven of us to service um about 1700 employees in three different countries 
Um, so it's not a not a huge team considering we were also responsible for um, people analytics. We're also responsible for employee experience, engagement, um, and, and internal communications. Um, uh, so that, that's that kind of roughly maybe gives you the size of of um, uh, um, uh, our organisation and and also the team. But the the mindset of continuous improvement helps you look for efficiencies along the way. So we find better ways to do things. We didn't have a huge budget. We also didn't have a huge team. My ambition from the first case was to start measuring things so I can show the value of this. So that when I go to my executives and say, we need to invest more in this or I need a bigger team, I can say, here's where it's working. Here's where the, here's where the return is. Um, here's where we can, here's where we're better placed to put our efforts now. Uh, and that's, a, that's the best business case that you can do in this space is to show this is working. We can well, we can turn it up if you need us to, and um, give us more stuff, and we'll do it. Give us more people, and we'll do it. Yeah, yeah, that's really sound advice. And I don't think I've ever met anybody that would claim to be over resourced in people and culture, well being, safety. So, um, no, no, we're all doing ten jobs each. The P and C people are the best. Um, let's share a couple more. I mean, little, a, a, advice for the audience. You've obviously learned some lessons along the way. Um, are there two or three pieces of advice or failed experiments that you would encourage people might like to avoid? Um, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, the mistakes I've made and the, the ones I hear now working working with clients is is, um, is the things you kind of wish you'd done differently or the, the kind of feedback that you get. One of the big ones is delivering exactly what your people wanted and then no one shows up. So that one's pretty tough. <laughs> you know, you put a survey out, you go and speak to people and you, you get a good understanding of what people want to come along to or they need or they're, they're after. And then you go and design it and then, you know, no one turns up or no one uses the thing or no one. That, that one's a pretty big mistake and hard to hard to overcome. There's a constant challenge of getting people to attend or participate getting the getting the budget for things you know having not getting the budget for things or maybe spending it in the area that you thought was going to be the best best to spend it in and it not not quite having the results you wanted uh, and then the other one is you know coming up with ideas it could be really tough um i don't know about the best bit of advice i'm trying to think of something specifically but i think i think when you're in this this kind of role when you're putting out solutions or you're designing strategies or products or 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 um, programs for your people i think it's to have a marketer a product design and a data mindset okay and i know that's kind of moving in three different areas but being in people and culture or hr i'm sure we're used to it we have to put on many different hats but i used to liken it to kind of running your own business right you know you've got a product and you've got a market you've got something that you've you know program or strategy and you've got a market you've got your audiences and I think you have to show the value all of the time. You have to advertise and promote. You have to use your influencers. You have to constantly collect feedback and update what you do. And this means um, keep returning back to what people need, uh, understanding what it is that's preventing them from being involved and, 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 and challenging yourself to having good solutions um, uh, to those objectives. Um, and if you need ideas, then research. If you if you're run out of ideas, speak to others. If you need to repackage things um, and repackage them, don't re reinvent all the time. Those would be some of the things I would I would provide as suggestions. We're going to launch our second poll, um, and this plays into the kind of the flip side of this. So Ryan's going to talk about the the, the, the big six. So which one of each of you? Which one of the following? And you can choose one. Um, would make the biggest positive impact to my well-being program. Um, and I'll give you kind of 20 more seconds or so to contribute to this one. Um, sort of seems to be neck and neck at the moment between senior leadership support and higher employee engagement. All right. I think we can see the results there. Um, the winner, so two, two big challenges that everybody's looking to address is um, higher participation rates and senior leadership support. Um, Ryan, let's take kind of five minutes to go through your big six. Um, and I'd love to get your perspective on some of the, um, the, the kind of common uh, goals here. Yeah, and that's, um, I mean, it's no surprise that those, those were the top two 
kind of answers that came through. It's looking at your two big audiences. You know, you got your leaders and you got your employees, and you're trying really essentially to get them engaged. So you want your leader support and you want your employees um, uh, engagement. And that's the, the the biggest advice I give around that is to think about what's in it for them. And they are two different audiences, right? They can be the same sometimes, but they're two two different audiences. Like what's what's really going to get leadership support? So you have to get in the mind of them and think about what are they trying to gain in their roles and what are their what are their pain points? And the same for for employees. It all goes back to understanding and engaging with those with those audiences. So it'd be a two it, it it's no surprise because you know leaders and employees are humans, they're people, they have changing needs, they've got different needs and they've got different priorities. And in the last few years, we've we've kind of seen a lot of a lot of changing priorities um, uh, and changing important things in everyone's life. So, so those ones, those ones are commonly tough and they probably should be. So that's so that's good. Um, but why does well-being fail in organizations is really the question here. So this is the big six that I've that that I that I come up with, but I'm sure that we all have stories about this. Um, I've been studying it for about 10 years and geez, I've made a lot of errors in, in this space myself. But what I see is the reason that well-being fails is really, you know, is leadership support. Like we've all just mentioned, if, if we don't make well, if leaders don't make well-being a priority, then employees don't get the message. They don't get the message that it's, um, the, rather they get the message that it's not important. So I think that's, there's a flow on effect there that if they don't have the leadership support, then likely employees aren't as engaged. Now, when employees don't feel like they own the well-being strategy or they don't understand why it's valuable or why it's valuable to them, then they might not be invested in it. And I think that's one of the reasons why, why uh, well-being programs fail is because they don't, they don't speak to the employees. They don't have that brand story. They don't have that, 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 those key things that employees can see when they look at the program or look at the strategy. That's for me and I can benefit from this. Um, and I have time for this and my, you know, the, the, uh, the pain points have been alleviated. Um, you know, it's tough to develop and implement effective well-being programs if they don't have the resources. So if you're not, if you're limited there or they're not allocated well, then, then, then that could be, that could be a reason why they fail. Um, uh, if well-being is treated like a separate initiative, um, it can be hard to align it with uh, organizational priorities and initiatives. And that's one of the things I always always advise my clients on is think about when you're in the creation or when you're re-implementing or changing things up is don't treat well-being as over here. Think about what your business needs, where it's going, what the business plan is for the next little while and see if well-being can help it get there. So treat it as part of the business strategy or how it can help or support the business and its strategy. The other one as well as I've spoken about a lot is without data and evaluation. Um, it's really hard to make informed decisions about well-being, not only in its design, but in the, in the resources that get allocated to it. And then the last one, if employees don't know about the well-being programs and uh, they don't know what's available to them or don't understand what the benefits are, then they don't take part. So that's the importance of, uh, of comms and marketing. And that's how I'd wrap up, wrap up the big six. But probably we probably all know this stuff that's why that's why i like this space is because we know this already just sometimes framing it in this way that we get that aha moment and and get towards good solutions that's right and and data is is so important um we're going to launch another poll while ryan talks a little bit about the work that he's doing now and we're going to share some more information later but Oh, and I'm sorry, I've just missed it. Um, we're going to go into a little bit later. Um, we'll launch it now, actually. The, a poll around, do you feel as if you have the data and expertise to effectively report, report on the effectiveness of your program? And I think the reason we ask that is success compounds and the types of results that we want to see compound. Um, all right, it's looking like 85% no. All right, Ryan, let's talk about the work that you do in consulting because we know that you have a big focus on data and there's a very clear need here. 83% um, of the audience are saying they don't have the data that they need today. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's a that's one of the first things I do do with clients is is kind of work, you know, you want to work out your your um where things are at right now. And if you want to know where things are at, then you need to you need some data points. So you need to speak to people, or you need to to look at what what data is available. Um, and so that's one of the first first protocols for me is let, let's have a look at what you have, um, and then strategically as well, you want to get to a desired state. And that's one of the things I help map, and it's a really simple exercise, um, and it can help you 
a, a hell of a lot. Uh, is from a from a data or data perspective, is is having a whiteboard or a Miro board or whatever you want to do and draw a line down the middle, um, and on one side you put um, all the things that you measure right now, and on the other side is all the things that you wish you could measure, and then from there you've got some great things um, about the setup of your of your desired state, so where you want to get to. Let's look at well, is there anything on that right hand column? So the stuff that we want to measure, is there an easy way to get that? And can we put that into the program? So if, if you're one of those, those people who've just answered no, that would be the simplest way I can say to make a start in that area. It's just working out what you need and what and what you don't have. If it comes to about sorting your data, it might be about expertise, but it might be about putting it all in the one place. It might just be, you know, biting the bullet and spending the time to get that right because you know that it's going to going to impact a, a hell of a lot there forward. So that's that's one of the big challenges I'm seeing right now. Um, uh, but I think having just the, the the ambition to be good in this space can can help. And this is the reason, isn't it? You know, um, set a benchmark, set some goals. Yeah, this is ultimately That's, your goal, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, and that, I mean, I think you know, overall, as well being something we can influence, then the answer is hell yes. And 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 uh, you know, strategically, I like to think again. You probably heard throughout this call the the the, the theme of simplicity. I think that you know, just thinking about three ways or the strategy or this three pronged approach, another three punch combination for well being strategy. The first is to uh, improve happiness. So you know, that's promoting the positive practices. You know, supporting your people's physical, career, financial, social, and community well being. You know, prom promote those protective factors. The other is to reduce risk. So that's having a look at what you can remove and control in the workplace around those factors that you, you think um, uh, uh, are hazards. And the last one is help people get better. So having a good approach to supporting people who are sick or injured to return to health. And I think if you're serious about this and care about making a difference in your workplace, then the, the best thing you can do is think about strategy and program for your people. And these are the, the, the three things that I typically repeat is to try and improve happiness, try to reduce risk, and help people get better. And if you can think of initiatives underneath three of those columns, you're usually laughing. Yeah, there's a lot of focus on the reduction of risk at the moment. Um, I want to hurry up, so I want to give proper time to questions. I think we can combine, um, you know, you've accumulated, I, I know you're, you know, in the literature, you are um, very studious, You've accumulated a lot of direct experience in workplaces as well as consulting. Um, I'd love to share, uh, I guess, your summary of this evolution over the last 30 years and what that might look like for the future and how that plays out. Wow, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, so if we try and summarize maybe the last 30 years, that's a big a big challenge, right? But if we go back in, uh, back in the day when most of us started working, right, the general attitude was leave your personal life at home. You know, we were expected to show up and leave our problems behind. And I call this stage denial. Thankfully, things have changed a fair bit. You know, we've come a long way since then. And most workplaces can understand that, you know, supporting their employees' well-being is something you should do. Uh, so we've entered a phase of acceptance, I think, where EAP has somewhat become the norm. Uh, I think it's a great start and really still very, very necessary, but maybe not good enough for the overall kind of strategic view on things about improving well-being rather than just responding to crisis. So I think somewhere along the way after this EAP phase, we've entered the sugar hit phase, as I like to call it, where companies and tech bros attempted to solve all their problems with uh, footballs, yoga and uh, table tennis, which, you know, what's well, amazing for promoting health and fun, uh, but doesn't really address the root cause um, uh, of, of workplace stress. You know, it's um, uh, you know, having a conversation with someone and you tell them that your boss is an arsehole and you've got a manic workload and you've got no autonomy and zero role clarity and they give you a banana as a solution. You know, it doesn't really match. Um, I think recently spurred on by the kind of pandemic that we've gone digital with, with workplace wellbeing. Um, so we've seen a bunch of expensive tech promising to cure all of our wellbeing woes uh, from with online workouts. You know, um, uh, again, this stuff can be amazing, but it maybe doesn't uh, only appeals to a fraction um, of people who get value from from online workouts. It's not really a holistic view. And I think right now we're at this critical point, right? We 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 seem to be looking at well being through a risk lens. Um, so I'm a stoic, right? So I'm indifferent to 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 most things, including risk. It can be good, if done don't done well, or it could be bad if it's not. 
So I think we could acknowledge what this phase is right now um, uh, uh, is kind of this risk lens phase, right? So we've got this opportunity to make real changes in the workplace well-being, to really understand it and uh, what our own well-being culture is and what its needs are. And that's what gets me excited about Unmind because uh, it leans into this opportunity to understand your people, to understand your culture better and how to support both. Uh, and also make informed decisions about what to do. And it's a data source uh, about what to do and what your needs are rather than this scattergun approach that we seem to have had in recent years. So I think in terms of making predictions, it's kind of like an either or. We could you know, take too long and uh, not seize the opportunity because we make things more complex than what they need to be. And you know, we get you know, in sort of complexity crisis and don't act. Or we can use this risk lens to, to, to like tick boxes. That's usually what happens in a risk lens approach. Or what I'm hoping is we can use this risk lens to, to get next level, you know, take it seriously, understand it well, move on and start to design better workplaces, environments, cultures, uh, and, and, and better well-being outcomes, better off with the knowledge. Um, uh, so that's, that's what I think, either or, but I'm, I'm really, really hoping my heart is on, um, uh, is on number three there for what next. Yeah, I'm seeing the green shoots too. I think... Uh, yeah, obviously the psychosocial has an obligations has given a really good impetus has elevated the profile of the work that everybody's doing. The board is now sitting up taking notice and ready to invest. I think here yeah, with the right support and, and people like you, everybody can get to number three. Um, we're going to go to some questions. I think one thing we uh, we want to promote and then I'm going to share a, res a resource that you'll love from Ryan. We, Unmind has just made um, our champions training free uh, at no cost, downloadable from our public website. This QR code is going to get you there. Um, basically, a step by step for how to activate this champions network in your business. You're going to get all the videos and, and things to promote it. Um, when we talk about you know pooling resources and, and 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 bringing the effective support to really embed this and and drive that systemic change, um, this will certainly help with that. Um, while I go to questions, I'm just going to have uh, another resource from Ryan. Uh, maybe do you want to explain very quickly, first of all, what this resource is all about? And then I'm going to fire some questions through to you. Nice one. Excellent. Yeah, this resource, uh, really simply put, is I was trying to download everything I've learned in 10 years and think um, if I was starting again, what would I like to have with me? Um, so it's a step by step guide on how you could create um, a, a, a world class well being strategy that's scalable to your own organization. So it's really just step by step through all the decisions uh, that you might have to make or all the steps you would need to take uh, in order to have a, a fantastic approach. Um, so it does talk about a lot of the themes I've spoke about today, but it's, it's really granular in terms of here's the stages, here's the steps. And I think it's quite empowering. Like there's nothing in there that has a dependency uh, um, uh, 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 on anything else. It could be done by you, by your team, uh, whoever. So it's a free resource. I'd encourage you to go and download it. And you know, if you want to chat about it, I'm here. Drop me an email. There's no salesperson at Exona. You're speaking to me. So yeah, um, uh, if you want to chat about it, then let me know. But I'd be delighted if you were to download it and go on and create better well-being. Perfect. Now, we, we always like to start, um, I'll put your information on here for anybody that would like to get in touch. Um, start with, we, we gave the audience an opportunity to pre-submit questions when they're registered. Um, there was some commonality, so I might be paraphrasing, but uh, this is a good one from Jesse. So when it comes to work, when it comes to well-being, how do you balance? What's your perspective balancing the responsibility of the organisation and the responsibility of the individual? It's a good question. Um, for me, well-being is a win-win, right? So if I'm if I'm thinking about well-being, then I'm thinking about what's in it for the organization and what's in it for the individual. And I then look to see where the crossover is. And that's your quick wins. That's your low hanging fruit. And who, how do we have something here? Or how do we make sure that responsibilities um, eh, eh, overlap? And that's a great source of inspiration for anything you do afterwards. So I'd look for the commonality. Um, eh, eh, and that's been really helpful for me. In terms of your responsibility, it, it is to both, right? There's no way to split it. Um, it is to both and you've got two or you get many stakeholders but you get two key ones the org and your senior leaders and your and your employees so i think i think that's always been helpful for for me to actually acknowledge the difference in stakeholders and then to look for that commonality yeah 
I love that. And I think it's a dilemma that everybody faces, as is this one. Um, I, don't, I don't know if everybody else can relate, but I'm hearing a lot of this in this April, May period where things are really ramping up. So we can probably relate. We have, a, 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 we have languishing workforces and everybody's just trying to get by, get through their to-do lists. What's your advice asking people to participate beyond their, their typical workload? Um, I think I think it's about creating something that's desirable, and I think that goes back to understanding your audience's pain points, um, and also what they can gain from what you have to offer. And I think if you can communicate that effectively, then people want to. Um, and I'm thinking of of some examples now, like um, uh, so understanding in the call center environment, largely nine to five or thereabouts, it's very difficult to get to things out that, you know, like doctor's appointments or, or physio appointments or chiro appointments and, and get your eye tests and all that. So it's like, you know, can you bring those things on site? Can you, can you help people do things before their work, after their work, during, during their, during their work and lunch hours and, and try and work around those, those times. Um, so but I think making sure that it's something that they want to do um, and making sure that it's desirable is probably the best, best thing first to focus on. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think we have time for a couple more. Um, here's a question that came in during the webinar. I think this, uh, again, is, it, it will be a common thread. As part of setting up a philosophy for measurement, other than participation, which a lot of people attach to, what other parameters do you recommend, do you feel are important to include when we talk about measurement? Uh, employee feedback. So that'd be the second one. Um, uh, that'd be the two simple ones, participation, as a, as a good gauge for showing you what people like and what they don't like or what people can attend and what they can't attend. But nothing goes beyond kind of getting that directly from uh, uh, some primary research. So, so surveys or focus groups, I like both. I um, like to have good conversations. I uh, also like to look at the data points there as well. Um, uh, other things, I mean, you can look at what your organization already measures. Do you have a productivity measurement? Do you have an absenteeism measurement? Do you have a turnover measurement? All of these are good indications of what people are saying or what through their actions um, uh, uh, um, uh, in relation to well-being or health. Um, the other one, your own analysis that you could do is could correlate participation to those other business metrics. So what does participation on the relationship with participation in your program um, say when you overlay it with um, uh, um, satisfied employee engagement data, um, uh, with absenteeism, with, with turnover? Um, so there's other good ones, and then going outside, can you can you get some some studies done? Can you you know health insurers are really good at this, where they you know give you surveys that you can put out to your people that measure their their um, um health and where it's at, so their you know risk factors and give you some give you some data around that. So I think there's there's, there's heaps of heaps of ways you can measure it, whether primary research, outcome driven research, actual analysis, um, uh, uh, or just general engagement surveys um I, I can probably think of a few more if you've you know if anyone wants to chat through this so chat through it free this is my topic what i love um uh, a measurement and i can think about some ways that might help you in your specific circumstance with the data you have available or could easily get yep. well i think we might have to end it there and, and ryan i think it's been very clear for everybody here today how passionate, how well informed um, you are in, in this area. And, and you know, you have certainly learned some, some valuable lessons and you've been accoladed with um, you know, the, the prizes that are obviously are very well deserved. And you've literally changed people's lives, as you mentioned at the beginning, was your overall objective. Um, yeah, I, I guess any any final words before we wrap up? Um, and again, from behalf of everybody at mind, thank you for coming and joining us and, and um, sharing your story. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to talk on this subject uh, uh, and also to partner with you. I love what you guys do. And um, uh, yeah, it's just been just been great to, to come and speak about something I'm passionate about and love to the to uh, to the people, people I like. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. We will send the recording along with uh, all of the assets and information. Um, yeah. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much.